Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome at Art Laboratory Berlin. We have uh, opened the exhibition Paired Immunity yesterday with great success. And as you can see, um, we have the pleasure to have um, the artist Marta de Menezes and the scientist Luis Grasa with us here in Berlin, with us here in the exhibition space. My name is Regina Rapp, and here is Christian de Lutz. And, um, we are here sitting together with Tutje Erel also next to us. And we are very looking forward for the next um, one or two hours uh, for an art and science talk, paired immunity. I quickly give a little introduction into the context of the exhibition and will introduce our dear guests. And um, I want to start um, with the context that this exhibition was planned for more than two years. And we were supposed to realize that show in 2020. And due to obvious reasons, due to the corona pandemic, we had to postpone it, which is very interesting because maybe in the course of the um, discussion later on, after talking about the exhibited works, we could maybe also talk about the phenomenon of immunity or virus, etc. cetera. Um, at the moment in Art Laboratory Berlin, um, we have this year had a lot of emphasis on projects of the biological and the mechanical. We are just had uh, finished a project under the viral shadow with a group exhibition and a conference. We will also go on in the autumn. So this exhibition fits perfectly paired immunity. And before we talk about contents, I'd like to say out a few big thank yous. So this project would have been never possible without the support of the Fondation Palus de Gulbenkian, who um, supported us in a, in a very fantastic way. And we are also very happy to have received fundings from the Berlin Senate. Thank you very much. And also thank you to our media partners, Art in Berlin and Clot Magazine, who will cover our project here. And also from a personal side, before I will introduce Marta and Luis, I really want to heartfully thank all the team here as we are for this project. Next to Chris is Tuche, Carolina and Sarah with uh, wonderful contributions just uh, to name the theme. So Paired Immunity is an exhibition project connected to an artist and a scientist who live together and work together, both based in Lisbon. And both works explore human identity and desire on cellular, medical, biotechnological, and ontological levels, as we will hear in a little while. It is a theme that we will hear is closely connected to the 21st century parables and our own corporeal limits. And now you probably have a lot of questions, but wait, here comes the biography. Dear Marta, who we are so grateful to have for not only a few, for a few days, but actually more than a week here in Berlin to already create new communities and projects, I would like to present. For those who are not familiar yet, you better are. Marta de Menezes is, has a really multifaceted background, art and art history. She has done her master's in history of art and visual cultures at the University of Oxford. And she has had her master's for fine arts and painting at the Faculty of Fine Arts in Lisbon. She is not only an artist of a very important generation, practicing for more than two decades important works and achievements in the fields of bio art, but she also works as a curator, as an educator, as a teacher, um, for instance, and most of important, probably, we should name Cultivamos Cultura, an artist in residence and um, a, a culture center south of, uh, in Alentejo, south of uh, Lisboa, uh, where we were also invited from Art Laboratory Berlin to teach in the summer school this year. Then, just to name only a few of the achievements and the projects, let me just list uh, artistic affiliation. So as I said already, since 2009, Marta is the art director of Cultivamos Cultura in Saint Louis, Odemira. Since 2006, Marta is the art director of Ectopia, Experimental Art Laboratory in Lisbon. 
Then there are many artist residencies in the last 15, 20 years that Marta has gone through. Let me just only list up the most important ones. Department of Structural Biology in the University of Oxford, Symbiotica, School of Anatomy and Human Biology, University of Western Australia, Perth, and interesting also, and we probably, that is connected to the projects we will hear more tonight, is for the last three years, Marta has been an artist in residence in the Instituto de Medicina Molecular in the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Lisbon. Also interesting to mention that Marta has been a guest professor where in various sites in the US or in the Netherlands. And also there is interesting publications. For instance, last year, she did a contribution in the very important publication, Art As We Don't Know It, published by the Finnish BioArt Society, or actually, if you allow me to mention, Living Media Interfaces, a multi-perspective analysis of biological materials for interaction. And uh, she um, co-edited this with uh, other colleagues, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. For the, for the, for the end, before introducing uh, Luis, I'd just like to also uh, um, uh, mention um, that it's uh, very um, impressive that Marta, next to all these projects, has um, in, in initiated in 2018 the interesting um, format FEM meeting, Women in Art, Science and Technology, and you will probably definitely hear more about that, also on Art Laboratory Berlin, maybe in two years. And then there is the Transdisciplinary and Transnational Art and Science Festival, FACT, which is regularly ongoing, and Marta is last but not least, also very um, decisively active in the format in the, of the conference, Taboo Transgression and Transcendence, and everything else we're gonna discuss later on. Let me please also now introduce our dear guest, Luis Grasa, and we are, I just look over to our guests who are sitting in front of us, and we are very happy that you took time and came to Berlin, Luis. And for those who are not familiar, I would like to present you, Luis. So Luis has an, an MD from the University of Lisbon in Portugal and a PhD in transplant immunology from the University of Oxford. So he's currently a professor of immunology at the University of Lisbon Medical School, directing a research group at the Instituto de Medicina Molecular. His most significant scientific contributions have been related to the field of transplantation and autoimmunity. And this is exactly the projects also we have, we will be discussing tonight. Grasa has worked on strategies to overcome transplant rejection, as well as in the induction of immune tolerance in, in autoimmunity and allergy. Among these topics, he has been especially interested in the biology of different types of regulatory T cells, namely T follicular regulatory cells. This already brings us into the scientific world, which is a very important part of our art science talk tonight. Let me only mention a few of the many positions uh, Luis has had and has. So for several years now, Luis has a full professorship at the Faculty of Medicina in the University of Lisbon. He has been for many years the head of research group Instituto de Medicina Molecular. For many years, he was also associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine and before, there was a, an interesting project connected to his postdoctoral fellowship in the University of Western Australia in Perth, Australia. And also um, some years back, some maybe 18 years back, there was a postdoctoral fellow in the University of Oxford. This is interesting because affiliation bring also scientific questions. What is at least as important as what I said now, and I will come to the end, no worries. I want to stress the fact that Luis is very open to artistic projects. And this brings us into the art science world, into hybrid art. So, public understanding of science. Grasa is committed to promoting the understanding of scientific research in society. Therefore, he has been very involved in activities to increase scientific literacy, especially among young people. And I think for 16 months passing now, this is more than important. This has included open days, public lectures, appearances in media, radio, television, printed press, etc. 
He has a long-standing collaboration with visual artists interested in developing artworks, exploring the interface between art and biomedical sciences. Grasa has hosted over 10 visual artists in the lab over the years and participated in collaborative artworks with artist Marta de Menezes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I should now mute myself and I should hand over to wonderful Marta and Luis. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the kind and thorough introduction. I'm very, uh, for me, it is a pleasure to be here as it is a pleasure to collaborate with artists. It is, uh, I want to stress that it is something that you mentioned, that it is for me important to strive these collaborations between artists and scientists. Uh, some, uh, I have not only collaborated with Marta, but some of the artists that today collaborate with Art Laboratory Berlin, and I think, for example, of Carolina, also spent some time working in our laboratory in Lisbon. And I think that's a, a good example of um, collaborations that can be fruitful for the artists, but also for the scientists involved. And I would like to present uh, a few slides while I describe a little bit from my side what these collaborations uh, represent and leading to the context, to the artworks that I've been developed together with Marta and that we will be discussing not only B, but also uh, Marta. And I, I would like to start uh, uh, saying that, of course, that I work in immunology for over 20 years, and for me, the immunology is the most fantastic of the systems of the body because it conceptually, it raises very important questions. The immune system is what protects us against pathogens, pathogens in constant mutations. We have heard a lot this past year about variants of a new virus and also of this new virus, and we know that if a new virus appears in the future, the immune system can respond to that virus in the same way that we have all experienced the fact that the immune system can respond to this virus. And this is because the immune system can respond to anything that exists and anything that does not exist. It has to do that in order to anticipate any mutation or any new virus that may arise. And this is achieved by discriminating what is self, what is our composition from anything that is not our composition in order to protect our body against what is not our composition. And what is fantastic as a way to protect us against infection becomes a problem in transplantation because very small differences between us and the donor can be perceived by the immune system and invariably leads to rejection. And that is why all transplant recipients need to re receive medicine that dampens the action of the immune system to prevent transplant rejection. This year, we all passed through a, a, an environment just like this. This is a picture of a COVID-19 vaccination center in Lisbon. And of course, that now we have been facing the largest vaccination campaign ever deployed in the world, an historical moment, really. But what has happened in this process uh, led to a surge of interest in the immune system. However, the immune system, although conceptually is fascinating, it is difficult to, to, to work with by visual artists. And that is my experience in the interactions that I have been having with artists that spend time in my laboratory. And let me explain a little bit what I mean. So the immune system has many components, cells, molecules, and so on, that maintain this homeostasis. And what I mean homeostasis is the ability to fight what is foreign, but being harmless to our constituents. But to investigate these, we don't really have an organ. So neurosciences have a brain, uh, cardiology have a heart, 
and all these organs are visually very identifiable and so on. Immunologists study cells that are spread throughout the body. And we often don't see cells individually. We have uh, equipment that allows us to study many cells at once. And these are the sort of outputs of the equipment that we use to visualize cells with different characteristics. These that are called TFH that are on the top right are indeed the cells that are critical for the production of immune, uh, of antibodies following vaccination with COVID-19 or whatever. This is from a research project that uh, Somya Kumar in the laboratory has been developing to understand response to different types of vaccines. And often we test hypotheses that we represent with these complex diagrams that we tried to dissect doing experiments, or this is another diagram that was in one of our papers. And we, in order to dissect if this is correct or incorrect, we often use very indirect ways to assess the function of cells. In this example that was recently published, what we have done was to see all the genes that are active in every uh, individual cell from a group of about 1,500 cells collected from the human blood, human lymph node, and human tonsils. And this allowed us to show how some of these cells that are important for the production of antibodies against vaccines develop in normal human tissue. But again, we use uh, data and computer sciences to make sense of what the cells, how the cells differentiate in order to test these hypotheses. This is something that is challenging for visual artists. This is another example. You, you, we used, and again, to prove an hypothesis, we use a ratio of unspliced and spliced RNA. So the RNA that has just been synthesized from DNA or the one that has been processed in order to validate different hypotheses. So for different artists that have worked in our laboratory, and this is an example of a few of artists that recently some, spent some time in our laboratory. Uh, but I want to stress today in the collaborations that I've had with Marta de Menezes, that for the reasons all of you know, is my favorite artist. And I don't get tired to say this time and time again, because it is true. <laughs> And this is the first work that I want to, to, to talk to you about. It is called Immortality for Two. It is on display here in the gallery, just over the corner of the gallery. And it was the first work where we directly collaborated. It has been very frustrating for me to see the success of Marta through collaborations with different scientists doing projects in scientific disciplines that are not as interested as immunology. And it was necessary to wait for over 10 years before we start collaborating in one project. And, it, and the project was this Immortality for Two, where we, uh, we took advantage of the process that we use in the laboratory to make what we call cell lines in order to immortalize lymphocytes or immortalized immune cells from Martha and from me. And you know, artists always strive to create artworks that overleave the, art the artist himself. And now we have an example of an artist that creates an artwork with immortal cells that have the potential to outlive the artist uh, herself in this case. And of course that we uh, immortalized uh, Marta cells and my own cells, but since these are immune cells, they cannot be together in the same space because they will reject each other, like a transplant would be rejected. And as a consequence, they are displayed. Uh, so this is the process of immortalization. They are displayed in a long table where the two flasks containing the cells are in opposite sides of the table to stress the separation, the isolation in these immortal cells, and the only place where they can be together is in the intersection where the two video projections overlap. 
The second project that is more to do with, directly with uh, my own past research in transplantation is called Antimata, where we shared skin grafts. And with these, uh, both Marta and myself acquired a new sense that forever has a memory of the molecular composition of the other. As the immune system can uh, discriminate what is self from what is non-self, we already knew that these uh, transplants would be rejected. So this is the reproduction of an experiment by John Van Root that discovered through this sort of experiments, the rules of histocompatibility, of the matching between donor and recipient. And this was done through similar sort of experiments. And as a consequence, we knew from the start that the transplants would be rejected as it is represented in this slide. But through this rejection of the other, we acquired a molecular memory of the composition of the other that will forever be in each one of us, like a new sense, a sixth sense that will identify uh, the other. And this is uh, also presented with a, a video that, that explains this uh, phenomenon. Usually we finish our presentations showing the people that contributed to the work. And since I showed work from Samia Kumar and Philippe Ribeiro, that are the two uh, members that are on the right, this is uh, an incomplete presentation of my lab because now there are more people, but I want to thank the lab members and to the remote audience today. Thank you. So apparently now it's my turn and I need to change the, the presentation. And now we go to my presentation and I can just turn on the, there, everybody sees what we see and I need to keep my hand here. No. <laughs> uh, so um, what do I say after this, right? Um, um, so, my name, as you know, is Marta, and, and, and I'm an artist, and um, it has been a pleasure to, to work with uh, my life partner, Luis, in these, uh, in these two projects. We have uh, quite, well, at least two more that we plan on doing together, uh, and I'm very happy for that. Um, it is a pleasure to be here at Art Laboratory Berlin. It's been a long time coming. Um, and uh, and uh, finally, uh, managing to be here for a little while with Regina and, and Chris is fantastic. Um, so I will go on and start talking about the project. So as most of you know, my, um, um, my interest uh, and my practice in art is focused on a specific umbrella theme. And because uh, uh, I'm dedicated to, to any challenge to the uh, concept of identity, I jump around different fields of biology because I still believe that biology is the field that is uh, more active, actively producing knowledge that challenges um, our understanding of ourselves um, today. And so the, it's, a, it's an endless field uh, of... of, uh, of uh, possibilities for me uh, and, 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 and this, an endless source of wonder uh, in, in, in trying to understand a little bit more um, what we are and, and who we are. Um, so I've, I've worked in many different laboratories. I've worked with many different organisms with many different scientists. And like Luis said, um, in, in 2014, when working on the concept of immortality and what, how does it relate to issues of identity, it became very clear that this was the moment, the right moment to start a collaboration with my life partner, because who wants to become immortal on your own? And, 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 and who would I want to share immortality with, with whatever that immortality means would always be um, someone um, that is very, as close to me as Luis is. So we, um, we worked on immortality for two together. For me, immortality for two is um, 
about issues of, uh, uh, of uh, how um, immortality uh, is, in this case, achieved through creating uh, uh, two cell lines, two immortal cell lines, which are actually cancer uh, cell lines, and how this um, this uh, strange paradox of of having cancer be uh, the path to immortality is something that is very interesting to me uh, in terms of identity. I, I, I think a lot about how uh, immortality and the way we understand immortality and, and how humans think of immortality or the achievement of immortality as a goal, um, and, but also how we imagine this is always uh, very much attached to this idea that there's a price and most often than not the price is the loss of humanity and this loss of humanity is often associated with isolation if you become other if you lose that uh, humanity when you become immortal um, then the price is is isolation and in this in this work I, I think I really think that this is very well expressed so we achieved immortality together and in parallel by transforming each other's cells uh, from the immune system into um, immortalized cell lines but through this the price still was isolation we cannot coexist as immortal cell lines in the same space except in a virtual uh, overlapping of the two images like Luis said so I think this is incredibly relevant for for thinking about identity and how this uh, this um, this um, understanding of the self and, and 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 what we are is challenged by our own ambitions in a way um, this this piece, as we said, is exhibited uh, in a in a on a on a surface on on the surface of a table. The cells there are on opposite sides of the table, and and uh, for people who came to the exhibition um, opening yesterday, they could understand that these are live cells that they are there uh, on the table, and then the but they are the the they are live. Uh, 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 projected onto the table. So if you move the flask, the cells um, change position and, and, and they're very much there. Um, the process was, was, uh, was done in the lab, in Luis's lab, and we did it in parallel. The second work that we have here at Art Laboratory Berlin is Anti-Marta and I, as, as someone uh, very interested in identity, I, I, I can't imagine how I could even uh, uh, not uh, reflect a little bit on self and non-self. Um, it took me a few years to figure out exactly what would be the first project to think about self and non-self, and it was it was wonderful to 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 think that it was. Um, um, uh, it was a, a challenge between me and Luis to, to do something like this, to do something which was done in the body. Um, I was talking to some of the visitors yesterday and it, it, it's interesting to, 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 to realize that the first project that we did together was outside of our body, but the second project that we did together is actually us. Yeah, so um, we are the artwork because we are the recipients of this memory. Uh, and it was one of the challenges, again, in trying to represent the piece or, or trying to give form to a piece where the artwork is, 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 a, is a living, uh, moving uh, person that cannot be always, uh, um, or it's not our uh, choice, it's not our option to be always in the exhibition space to be looked at. So um, the strategy was to um, create a documentary that explained a little bit of the relationship that we have and the, the history behind uh, developing these concepts together, um, but also how to uh, allow the public to come into this position of uh, um, sharing um, uh, rejection and sharing this sixth sense that we are developing through the, the production of antibodies 
by uh, projecting the, the, um, the surgery onto a table that you then uh, can see uh, the surgery happening on your, your hand, I think was a, a, an incredibly su successful strategy to, to really bring the piece into fruition uh, formally. Um, I don't want to show the video. I just also um, very briefly want to thank, um, I feel very privileged to have worked with so many different scientists along my career, their friends, their colleagues, um, and they are uh, people that I value tremendously for their generous, generosity of ideas, their generosity of space, their generosity of, of, um, of contributions. And they come in, in many different ways to all of the projects that I've been crazy enough to throw at them. So um, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you both so very much for um, really fascinating and um, presentations. Um, I guess I, I get ask a question for both of you. Um, in Immortality for Two, you have a kind of a virtual convergence. And it was interesting yesterday, not only uh, is there a, an actual as well as virtual rejection or actual rejection in anti Marta, but it was interesting to see yesterday the reactions of many people when they actually put their arms down. And they, you know, in their neurons, they're uh, kind of often pulling back and rejecting the, the assumed pain. Um, um, yeah, uh, this art has this level where it works in the mind. And then you were talking about artworks about uh, immunity, which are in the level of the cells that have their own, uh, we could say, I don't know if cognition is the right word. Um, so how would you uh, talk about the parallel art and science discussion of uh, in the works of uh, um, what it is to come together or not the impossibility of coming together? You, you, you know, you, I think you see it, you, there are certainly convergence of your viewpoints, but you also have different, very unique uh, uh, points on that. Well, I think it's, um, these sorts of artworks are very complex and there are, they are, although they are not abstract, they are the opposite of abstract, they are very real and physical and specific, they are open to many different interpretations and it is different people with their own backgrounds, with their own uh, concepts can extract different meanings from these artworks. So it is natural, and maybe the first point, that an artist and a scientist with different backgrounds will have a different way to read the same sort of artwork. In the same way that, as you said, different visitors will also respond differently to these artworks. And some of them may be very impressed with the, the physical nature of some of the images that include blood and surgery, while some others may be less uh, responsive to, to those aspects and more responsive to other aspects that are related, for example, with the nature of the relationship between Martha and I and how these are uh, transferred to the artworks. So uh, I think that the diversity of the interpretations defines the complexity of these artworks that are complex and explains the different reactions by the different people in the audience. I don't know if I have anything um, much more to add to that. Um, I, I, I think um, I think that's the pleasure of collaborating in, in, in any kind of project. And I can imagine that everybody who has done a project that is a collaborative project, it's the richness of having different perspectives come together to build, to create a form that is one form, but it's the form is, um, is sort of sort of like, I see it a little bit like a focus of a lens that then multiplies as well. Because when the public sees it, that is like the prism, you know, it's like the rainbow of, of multiplication of interpretation. So you have 
it's it, this is I I really like this idea that the piece is just the lens where convergence happens and then diffraction comes out the other way, um, and 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 I do think that this is very much the richness of working with different disciplines um, is you 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 navigate this this moment of learning enough about the the other discipline that allows you to exchange a little bit of the parts that you become a little bit you be, become familiar with the process of of a different discipline and and suddenly you're doing you're exchanging a little bit the 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 roles within making a piece it it is it is it is one of the most pleasurable things that I can that I can think of, um, and I hope this is very clear also, as as the lens works. If the lens works well, then this becomes visible also on the other side. I'm not sure if this is what you wanted <laughs> to discuss, but uh, it it was what uh, what made what brought to my mind when you were uh, um, asking the question. It was also interesting because you were talking about um, biology as being the one discipline that gives the most information about, about life, but also about, you know, about our existence or, um, and it, that way you describe it actually takes biology um, as not only being uh, a natural science that's uh, exploring, you know, knowledge for its own sake, but actually brings it over to, you could say, the territory of what's vaguely being called the post-humanities, this kind of zone where after the humanities had split away from the sciences and then now in an era their you know situation uh, has forced them to it, the humanities to make a have a um, a new relationship with the natural sciences but especially in biology it brings up many of the questions of ontologies of epistemologies uh, and it also made me think of um, so your idea uh, your approach from biology is being extremely relevant in our age and maybe you can't have a post-humanities without an in-depth relationship between them and biology. At the same time, Luis was writing about um, how, how art, uh, if art was gonna function as a science communication, it couldn't be like a descriptive or uh, purely didactical thing, but it has the power of, of asking difficult and new questions. Uh, maybe I could talk about it, could talk about some of the questions that the, these pieces have brought up to you or to your colleagues, so people in your lab when produce, producing it. Um, but you know, also uh, think about um, exactly this this melding of uh, of disciplines, and uh, it, we start to live in an era where we have the knowledge from biology of impending disasters coming or current disasters. But the problem is, is that that knowledge, uh, people are making decisions and choosing to avoid the knowledge or because it's sometimes unpleasant. And so there's this, this idea of you, we have to um, take, a, I guess, a, a, a mindset and a wider scale that incorporates that knowledge and interprets it in, in different uh, you know, uh, aspects that are more uh, digestible or important for people to bring a more general understanding. So, I, I I I I do see biology as an, an extremely active field of knowledge right now, that brings challenges to the other fields of knowledge. I don't see it necessarily as the where I do challenge the idea that biology would have any pre predominance in 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 knowledge itself. Um, I think biology and the sciences are a knowledge that is characteristically factual and this is what they're supposed to be but i also believe very strongly that knowledge is not limited to facts and if, otherwise philosophy would <laughs> would be problematic uh, and I, I and philosophy is the beginning you know it's it's the source of all of the the, the multiplications of forms of knowledge that are are produced and, 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 and made by humans. So I do believe that biology is the source of factual knowledge that challenges more uh, the knowledges that are based in, in, in uh, 
thought experiments more in, in thought processes of trying to understand what we need, what we know uh, intellectually mm -hmm. and, and make new knowledge through that, then we need to, um, uh, my understanding is that we need to also um, have a, a more uh, permeable uh, uh, um, uh, membrane between these knowledges. Factual knowledge needs to feed into uh, uh, theoretical knowledge more and philosophy and, and all of that. And, and, and the other way around, because that permeability exists, but it's not always acknowledged on, on all fields. You know, do you? No, I, I, I agree. I think that it, it is important. And it is also this permeability to other fields. I think um, it is important. And I think part of the reason why these artworks are important in terms of communication of science is not the literal communication of the science that is in, the, in those artworks, but it is at two levels. First level is to generate uh, curiosity regarding what are the concepts, the, 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 the science that is behind it, that the artwork does not give the answer, but maybe create some curiosity in the person. But more important than that, it is the increased familiarity of the audience with science and scientific concepts. And I think that one aspect that is important is to understand that science is not something that, that is beyond the barrier, it is accessible and the results from the science influence the day-to-day -day life. And in the same way that they influence artworks and the art practice, they influence many aspects of our life and that should not be a resistance uh, because the science is beyond a, a specific barrier and there should be a, a greater understanding and trust of what is produced by science and what uh, are the implications of that knowledge. This is really fascinating. Thank you so much to share um, your ideas with us, Marta and Luis. Um, I'm also letting myself inspired by the conversations we have had yesterday uh, during a very long opening day uh, due to well-known reasons of hygiene caution. And But uh, actually, we had very intense conversations with a broad audience, with journalists, and with uh, people from the field. And I was struck by various things. And um, one is the fact that it exemplifies um, analytically, conceptually, poetically, um, artistically, that you both work in this project together and you also, the two biographies, you show yourself in Antimarta. And there is this really fascinating movie where the filmmaker also uses um, the dual projection um, due to the couple that that tells the story. And I'm struck, and I think this is really a fantastic catalyzer to talk about uh, immunity and transplantation, that you are so open that you tell the private story. So I see so many layers in it. I see um, a dual process going on between art and science, a couple that comes more and more nearer, in my opinion. I see the story that a couple is telling me, a man and a woman in this case. And I see the story of bringing current scientific questions also to a broad audience. And this is actually possible in this way. And it's only in this way, in this interdisciplinary way possible. So this is actually what was one of many messages I got from yesterday's conversations with the audience. And then the performative act of using the arm or using the body of, of 
sitting at the table and as Chris said, trying to actually participate, like you see here, putting the arm on the table to, to come near to the idea of what it means to, to, to share biological substance, to create a memory in the beloved one's other's body or to actually leave a memory. I'm still learning my biology at the moment. So this was really fascinating. And I'm, as I said, as Chris is interested in the art and science part, and I think this is the embodiment in this project and that, that you let it happen and you share with us you know, also in this story of two people here. I think that is really um, um, giving a, an additional really layer of so many layers to this interesting project. Um, then again, non-self, self and identity that you repeatedly come to talk, Marta. I was um, researching a little bit what I would think of identity. And um, of course, in the course, in the context of the artwork, we would start from maybe biological identity or maybe personal identity, or maybe what means identity in a love relationship because it's also connected to, to the artworks. And then I was researching and I was finding thousands of plateaus of identity. And that brings us actually in this phenomenon that we are living in such a complex world where this, the inherent need of communication, which both artworks here invite us so perfectly, is very important. So next to what we already touched, medical identity, we have actually in the social science identity as a term for personhood or group affiliation in psychology or sociology, or actually we use maybe also identity in group expression or affiliation. For instance, we talk about cultural identity, like a person's self-affiliation or categorization by others as a member of cultural group. Or we can talk about identity politics, or we can talk about national identity, or about party identification. Or then actually we could talk about racial or ethnocultural identity. So this is actually really interesting, and, and I understand the work more and more, that you come from the particular field with reason, from biology. But it invites me actually, and the more I think about it, to really open up the field of the multitude connection of identity. And actually, we could continue, not now, but maybe in the future, with ethno-regional, philosophical identity, etc. So just saying that actually I'm in the midst of um, the inspirational um, process, actually, and um, connecting further this, uh, um, this term, this actually endless term. Um, yes? <laughs> Um, that was rather a comment, not <laughs> a question. Do you want to comment? Uh, it's just uh, that I remember that uh, um, I, I didn't say this in this uh, uh, talk, but um, we have been discussing this a lot. Part of my fascination with immunology uh, as searching for identity, and I think it relates to all of those, is, is, this, is this idea that we understand identity as something that is associated with cognition and with self-awareness. And that's very much associated with our brain, yes, and, and development. And one of the things that I find fascinating about immunology is that it challenges more than anything else that I can think of that preconception, that identity, or that understanding of identity, that identity is um, something that is indissociable from uh, from our brain which is before the developmental stage that we all go through where we are where we become self-aware of ourselves our immune system already knows the difference between self and non-self and this is probably one of the most fascinating parts for me to try and understand why immunology is important for the understanding of identity. It is beyond or pre the self-awareness moment. Um, and, and, and this is, this is really interesting, I find. Yeah, no? the, the immune system, unlike many of the systems of the body, is prometheic. It looks forward, it anticipates the future. It creates the conditions so that 
uh, it does not matter what will be the, the virus that will show up, the next flu virus that we do not know. We only know that it will be different from the last year virus. The immune system anticipates the possibilities. In fact, it anticipates all the possibilities and it covers all the possibilities in order to be able to respond to that virus regardless of what it is. So unlike other systems that take advantage of our experience, the immune system is designed in a way that the experience does not matter. It is prepared for everything. The experience just makes it more effective once it faces that virus or a vaccine or something that will make the response. It doesn't really mean designed. Evolved. <laughs> yeah. Because as Boltzanski said, in, 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 in everything in biology only makes sense at the light of evolution. So <laughs> things are fine tuned in a way that uh, sometimes appear that they have been designed that way. And this can be misleading for many people in many cases. But this is a trial and error and perfection through many years of evolution. Actually, it's fascinating in both works that your immune cells reject the cells or reject uh, cells from each other. But at the same time, they've evolved to accept a whole host of organisms that are, are microbiome. And even it's thought, I think, that the, the immune system is kind of regulated by some parts of the microbiome. And uh, um, yeah, so that, that's also like a really interesting thing because it also limits, uh, it, it changes the idea that our identity is not just a human, uh, a different humans, but there's a, there's a human, non-human acceptance. So more or less, so it, without a doubt that the microbiome and the environment influences the immune system, that can happen. But there is still a distinction between what is self and what is non-self. And the microbiome is outside us. So it is within the gut, the gut, but the gut is just a tube and it is in the exterior of the tube. Once the microbes get inside the, the body, they tend to elicit an immune response, even harmless microbes once they change position. Uh, but it is true that the immune system has mechanisms of tolerance that allow us to tolerate things that are harmless. A good example is, for example, allergens that for the majority of the population, they are harmless and they are tolerated by the immune system. But in a, in, in a relatively large proportion of the population, these are perceived as dangerous and elicit an inflammatory response that is allergy, that is the source of the problem, is the immune response against those allergens, not the allergens themselves because they are harmless. Well, this, this is fascinating. Now we are there. And I actually would like to come to the idea of identity that also stressed Marta. And I, I would say, without the microbiome, we would also have a lack of certain identity. So actually, maybe we have to combine the immune system plus the microbiome, maybe leaving aside the discussion of whether it is in our body or on our body. But as I learned from Francois-Joseph Lapointe, if we had a problem in our gut microbiome, it would, if, or what, however our gut microbiome is situated, it creates, it has a big impact of on our happiness or depressions. So actually talking about identity, who we are, I think this is really funny uh, to, 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 to think if it's, or it's, if it's interesting rather than funny, um, it's fascinating. Um, is it only the human cells or is it um, the, the, the other nearly 50% of cells on or in us? in the tube or however we define it. So, so I think here we have actually a close question of identity, the self, who, who we are. Yeah. Let me comment on that. So again, I want to stress <clears throat> that those uh, microorganisms are 
tolerated influences, but they are still perceived by the immune system as foreign if they change their location. Yet they indeed influence our immune system and they shape what we are today. Uh, I think yesterday I was discussing the work from two fantastic immunologists from the UK, Adrian Liston and Michelle Linterman, that studied many different individuals, some of them uh, genetically related, uh, that is uh, sister, brother, or parent, son, or whatever, and people that are not genetically related, but they share the same house, uh, families, where the, uh, the, diff the two partners, of course, tend not to be genetically related. And looking at many different immune parameters and how they change, these immune parameters are more closely related within people that share the same house. And as a consequence, they tend to share the same microbiome, the same environment, than between people that are genetically related, but mm -hmm. they do not live together. So this to stress that indeed the environment and the microbiome influences what we are immunologically. Mm -hmm. But uh, those, uh, those microbes mm -hmm. are not, are, if they change their location, they will be perceived as foreign by the immune system. Uh, in a way, in the same way that the, the, the wider environment, the sunlight, mm -hmm. temperature, and so on, also influences mm -hmm. our mood, mm -hmm. can make us more depressed, mm -hmm. and so on. But they are not, they are still external to us mm -hmm. and influencing us. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, think, I think it's it has to do and like everything, like every discussion, when you start thinking about concepts, you need to, you need to really, well, you need to one be be understand that the other person may not be talking about that same concept in the same way, and that they're they're slightly different. So when I think Regina, when you when you talk about the self, you're it's 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 a little bit like this phenomena that we have that our um, that our brain understands us not just at the limit of our skin, but also our clothes and sometimes a little bit further than that. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about self in that way, everything that is inside our gut on the surface of our skin is still us. And there are more cells on our body than there are uh, uh, human cells in our body. Yes, the, in terms of number, so the, then the challenge to identity is what, is it a question of st you know, statistical relevance? What's the weight of the cells of the microbes that are part of a microbiome or the cell or the weight of the cells that are the cells that include that, that have our DNA where mm -hmm. if, if it's just, if you put it on a scale, mm -hmm. maybe the ones that are, that don't have our DNA way more <laughs> to us than 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 the ones that are so you know okay. depends on how dense they are <laughs> very small yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> our cells are way more <laughs> but yeah if 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 i just I, i'm just imagining it i you know and this is because i was in a, a laboratory with evolutionary biologists in 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 the in the early 2000s where to check the dna of the butterflies you would put them in the blender and and then sequence the 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 dna that was there and a lot of that dna was not <laughs> was not the butterfly <laughs> it's for, for sure that there, is, uh, that there are many cells on us that are not human cells. Most of them are bacterial cells. And they are more than our cells because bacteria are very, very tiny. So you have many bacteria <laughs> that fit uh, next to each one of our cells. But again, that is to say that the bacteria in the microbiome are outside our body. It depends so, on what you mean by outside. Out, you know, if yeah. you think the barrier is the skin, then that is exactly what you mean. But that's a very literal understanding of what is outside and inside. I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe. 
maybe I am a little dense, but <laughs> but there there are there is a, a a physical barrier, the the mucosa of the gut and so on, and these are outside that. I understand. Yeah. It is biologically considered as outside. Uh, what I challenge is there's a little bit more than the biological definition of things. And identity is never, can never be understood exclusively as a biological definition of every, a, anything. Otherwise, then that, those two works over there make no sense. I think that now we are approaching something that is semantic more than science or whatever but, that no, I, I agree but with nobody was want, is wanting to make science here no no no. i agree with you but the thing is that uh, and i agree with you that those bacteria that are within our guts influence mm -hmm. our immune system and influence uh, uh, how our body works due to that but uh, trying to say that uh, we should change the definition of uh, self to include that, that is fine, but that is fine. I think it, it okay. is a different issue, but I think that the issue then is it starts to be what is these def definitions? Because what I'm saying is that it is a practical definition. So the part of inside our body that is irrigated by our bloodstream mm -hmm. and so on, uh, what is in the gut is not there. So it is within a tube that is outside. Okay. So we are like a donut and the, 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 hole in the, the hole in the bottom of this donut is the, is the, is the gut. And the bacteria are there in the middle of this hole in the donuts. I don't think anybody think. has that confused. Okay. What we are discussing are definitions, yeah. and definitions are concepts. Okay. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that theme also there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of new research on the chemical, on the uh, hormones, the chemicals that are produced by bacteria and how they influence through the vagus nerve and so on. Um, but that's an interesting question. There is also a comment and question from Margarita Pevere. It says, hi, Martin Luis. Thank you for your beautiful and strong work as always. Uh, I have a question regarding one of the recurring themes in your work, namely identity and self, non-self, and how the immune system shapes an individual. I recently read some writing by developmental biologist and emb embryologist Scott F. Uh, Gilbert that struck my attention. You may already know his work, and I can, uh, of course, uh, send you the writing to refer to. He refers to what traditionally defines the individual anatomical, genetic, developmental, immune, ph physiological, evolutionary, and reads through that the idea of the holobiont, uh, i.e. the immune system. He says, quote, the immune system, rather than being imagined as a force of protective soldiers made by the host, can be thought of a group of passport control agents and bouncers. Uh, uh, well, that was tipping the world upside down for me, and also in relation to your work. Maybe you can comment on that. I think what we have discussed was a little bit this, this issue, so I think it is exactly what we have been discussing. Yeah. I also think that it is important to, 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 to talk about um, something that we have discussed before, and actually it's some, one of the oldest um, uh, conversations that we've had um, and, and a recurring one uh, with you and with other immunologists, I have to say this idea that we that, that that science describes the immune system or has for a very long time. I don't think this is the case anymore, and I and this is what I would like to raise as well. This idea that the immune system is a warfare system, I think, is is one of the first things that was overcome when talking to, to immunologists in the lab, no? It, yeah. I think the, the reality of understanding the immune system right now is very different. Yes, we, we are tending more and more to see the immune system as an homeostatic system, like many others in the body, where it attempts to maintain the, a state of normal functioning of the body. And of course, that an infection disrupts this normal function of the body and needs an action 
to compensate for that and reinstate the natural state. And of course, that this compensation, if it is a bacterial infection, it will uh, require the killing of the bacteria, and this action may resemble an army and, and hence the, the, the comparisons in the past. But if it is not a bacteria, but it is the some uh, components, for example, dietary components that do not provoke damage, they may not disrupt this normal homeostatic state. And as a consequence, they tend to elicit a response that reinforces immune tolerance to those components and against uh, aggressive response against these components. And this way maintaining this uh, homeostasis. And I think that that is now becoming more and more the main view about how the immune system works, not just as a military machine, but as a, a, a mechanism that tries to maintain this balance. Yeah, I guess you could talk about a whole, um, the whole day of metaphors in science as being dangerous territory for situated knowledge. Um, okay, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Hermanu says, an intelligent bickering between a couple is the most delightful and enlightening part of the <laughs> evening. Uh, Colin Sigmund says, interesting. I think the idea about where you draw the line of the self is fascinating. When uh, thinking about the post-human self, we should consider the microbiome as part of ourself just due to the immediacy within our skin. When not considering other technologies which are immediately entangled to our self and our sense of identity without being physically within our body, Maybe not a question, just a thought. And Margarita asks, uh, after all, I agree with the feminists, the body is discursive, namely that we understand what we understand today as a body or nature or environment uh, is shaped by the uh, interplay of science and ideas uh, and the scientific tools available, reference to Barad. And as we know about the body centuries ago is now, what we knew about, what we knew about the century body centuries ago, or even decades ago, I'll add from my point, is now considered wrong. Okay, so, be, okay. so before I, as I know Margarita, uh, hello Margarita, mm -hmm. very nice that you are listening to me, so I can be also aggressive towards you. Uh, <laughs> and what I'm saying is that it, it, the same way that for uh, scientists, have been accused to use jargon sometimes that makes their ideas difficult to follow. Uh, I have some difficulty in follow uh, the language in humanities. And of course that I don't know Barat and many of the concepts that you discuss in your text are difficult for me to, to follow. So, uh, if you could translate these in lay terms, it may be easier for me to comment. And, and I'm sorry, Margarita, I'm just saying this because uh, I know you and it is... Uh, <laughs> you're, not, you're not endangering your friendship with, yeah. with, with this comment, I don't think. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, Margarita. Um, yeah, I, I think I think actually Louise pinpoints a very important aspect here, which which we sometimes forget because we look at it from the other side and, and we always remember the, you know, ah, we don't understand exactly what they're saying. And then we forget that they that the other person who's listening to us doesn't understand uh, also and doesn't have our library of of of, of terms and doesn't have our library of of our bibliography that we carry around all the time um so i don't know uh, i the the common column uh, uh, as as posted is 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 very interesting for me and and of course i understand this is this is this is this is why i'm so interested in identity and this is why for me when working on identity i i'm not just limited to the field of immunology it's because if you live in, you know, <laughs> and don't look at me that <laughs> with that sad face. <laughs> but you know, um, it was actually uh, one of your colleagues, Miranda, who 
uh, listening to my presentation at Symbiotica, do you remember, told me for the first time that all of my works relate to um, um, immunology. And this is the moment that I re self-reflected and said, oh, she's right. <laughs> and I had never thought about that. And, you know, I do, immunology is a complex concept that has many, actually, in identity, sorry, identity is a complex concept that actually is at the center of humanity, whether it's non-human, even, even when we try to exit the human sphere, we always refer to ourselves because this is our primary dimension. And, and this means that it is the, who we are, what we are is the focus of knowledge not just scientific knowledge, almost all the knowledge that we, we can produce is in some way related to this or in relationship to this reference. Margarita, you said something, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, uh, okay. what I would say is uh, we also have the advantage of having Luis share is that he's uh, involved very deeply in the vaccination program in Portugal and even on a European level as an immunologist and has a, a quite a good knowledge but certainly Marta must also have a very good knowledge in this way and maybe interesting uh, opinions from that knowledge um, and I was uh, a lot of writing recently has been about how basically COVID will become endemic or is becoming endemic that it we well, there's the, the door for no COVID closed probably a year or more than a year ago. And so we will be living with the virus for the foreseeable future. Uh, and we'll have to think of strategies and certainly we are doing that with vaccination. Uh, and, uh, but you know, maybe what does this mean in the next year? What, are our, what is our near term future, the next decade like? Uh, the decade as we and our immune systems uh, uh, more and more encounter this virus in different situations. Uh, and, uh, you know, what does it also mean for us as individuals or societies? Right. Uh, you are correct. I think that we, the, we are past the point where it is conceivable that we can eradicate SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we will need to to live with this virus, as with many other viruses that uh, cannot be eradicated and are present in our in our communities, uh, what we have, what we can predict, although it is very difficult to predict anything regarding this infection, but what past infections tell us is that as this type of virus tend to become endemic, they uh, tend to cause less damage in the population, let's say, because um, children are exposed to this virus, develop immunity with time as they grow up, they will be already immune and they keep interacting with the virus. So it will tend to become a, a lower problem. But what I want to stress is not that. I think that this pandemic had a huge impact in all the countries in the world. And I think that uh, the lesson that should be taken is for the future is less to do and to how we deal with this virus as it beca is becoming endemic, because we are fortunate that we have uh, effective vaccines that will help to protect the most vulnerable in these periods. But we need to face the reality that this will not be the last pandemic that we faced and we need to learn with this process in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic and not to do the same mistakes uh, that were done in this pandemic so that the response can be uh, more, effect more effective and the, the damage uh, lower than the damage that was caused worldwide uh, by this virus. I, I, this is way beyond my scope. Um, no, I, I, I think the, the last comment is, is very important. 
I think we need to, to remember to understand what were the mistakes that were made, why they were made, and how it can be better. Sometimes we forget because we want to overcome to to overcome the situation so much that we forget to analyze why some things didn't work exactly as they should, uh, or if we were fast enough, or if we were broad enough. And 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 I do believe that some systems that are still thought to us very um, locally uh, or nationally or in in sections of our, our our planet need to be thought maybe as a worldwide strategy and not so much as a not used so much as political uh, tools and and things like this um, but that's a very personal view on on what we can learn um, i would like also to become um a little bit more concrete and uh, use this wonderful opportunity to have you here with us, Luis. And exactly in a moment, we're sitting here in Berlin and exactly maybe what 18 months after it has come to Europe in March 2020, the um, COVID pandemic, that we are here in Berlin in a situation uh, where the majority is tired even to think and to waste energy about um, the caretaking and methodologies and methods, how we will face the pandemic slash endemic situation of our future. So I would actually like for our audience tonight and also for our world future audience who will see the recordings and especially the German audience. <laughs> yes, I know you do not want to deal with this. <laughs> and I would like to take this wonderful chance and thank you for all other thoughts, of course, as well. But I'd like to ask you, Luis, if you would be so kind to draw out a little bit to share with us what, what, how was it possible in Portugal to get so many people vaccinated? And what was the strategy or actually how is the situation, if you could tell us a little bit about it, to learn from Portugal? Well, that is something that I, I cannot do. I think that we are very fortunate in Portugal that we have a culture from the past that is very, um, that accepts with enthusiasm the, the concept that vaccines are very important for the protection of their children. And that is why the childhood vaccination is um, historically uh, on the top levels in Europe and also the vaccination of adolescents for example the onset of the vaccination of uh, female adolescents against hpv was a huge success in portugal and i think it tends to be related with the trust that the portuguese population um give to the to vaccines and to the to the implementation of vaccination policies in the country this trust was built over the years and now this COVID-19 vaccination took advantage that there is this very high trust in the population towards the towards vaccination and the protection that is afforded by vaccination but uh, it is difficult for me I'm not an expert in uh, psychology and the perception of people to to dissect what specifically are the causes for vaccine hesitancy that uh, are uh, that are present in in germany and for example in, in eastern european countries the vaccine hesitancy is even greater and that's i never studied that in detail and i do not know what are the reasons mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we should round this up. Yes. Maybe are there any questions from the audience? Or actually, Marta and Luis, do you have any questions? Maybe sometimes it arises that with I just yeah. I just want to, to say that I'm very happy to know that I'm still friends with Margarita. <laughs> <laughs> what wonderful. Yeah, we, we, we read this, Margarita, and as always. The discussions and conversations will be, of course, continued. As always, this was only a small glimpse 
of a whole cosmos of discourses and topics. And um, so now to the end of our talk. Maybe we can talk about upcoming projects as well. And we'll, we'll have some talks on. Exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, um, in, during the course of November, we'll have some other talks with artists uh, from around the world and scientists uh, on the uh, virus. It actually was a continuation of our Under the Viral Shadow program. Uh, so uh, I think we'll have, uh, including Sibla Neumeyer and Karolina Zinovich, also Caitlin Berrigan, White Feather Hunter, and Sebastian Kuchoba uh, in two talks later this month. So check our website in the middle of next week, and we will have uh, more information on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And for now, to the end of our talk tonight, I want um, from the bottom of my heart, thank Marta and Luis for not only being here in Berlin with us, which is just priceless, but also for taking the time and effort to sit down and repeat what is probably already so well known uh, for you, but just to share um, the, um, the knowledge with us, uh, the interdisciplinary knowledge with us. And I can just say um, already tonight, we've learned such a lot. Thank you so much uh, to the audience here that you have been uh, gathering tonight in a webinar. So you were not seeing one another, but we will continue the dialogue with, in person and in the next uh, virtual meetings as well. So what um, now stays for me to say is for the project, excuse me, for that project, <laughs> uh, Paired Immunity, uh, the exhibition, it uh, is running until the 12th of December. We will be open from Thursday to Sunday from 2 to 6 p.m. or, and as well, additionally, upon appointment. So if you know groups or seminars or so who want to visit us, please feel free to contact us. Um, thank you so much. Also, yes, Marta wants to say. I, I'm sorry. I just, I just also want to say thank you to you too, to um, uh, Art Laboratory Berlin, to the whole team, Tuccia and Sarah and Carolina, who, who worked so hard on this, uh, 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 <laughs> on this setup. Um, and thank you, Regina and Chris, for having me stay in your home for, for uh, about a week. Um, it was a pleasure uh, and, and, and it was a privilege. Um, I also want to thank everybody that came to the opening yesterday. It was such a wonderful uh, time that we had with uh, with some people that I uh, I'm, I'm I'm incredibly grateful that they actually came to Berlin to and 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 visit us um, uh, here at the opening. Um, it was wonderful to also see um, all so many friends from Berlin uh, who live here and who came uh, during this week and, and yesterday as well. It was it was um, um, food for my heart, yeah, food for my heart to 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 have this opening uh, in person yesterday uh, here at Art Laboratory Berlin, and also finally for all of you who are on the other side of this screen that we can't see unfortunately, and some of you are across the Atlantic and uh, and and beyond. So thank you very much for for listening to us and 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 to continuously <laughs> listen to us. Some of you just repeatedly come and, and listen to us. It's a, it's a very uh, heartwarming to know that you are there. Wonderful. So thanks to everyone. And um, maybe last sentence, stay healthy and safe. Good night or good morning or good midday. <laughs>